We're here to talk about dealing with trauma. Yes, we are. And this program is entitled Trauma Survivors Walking Each Other Home, because that's what we do each week, each Monday afternoon, if you're on the East Coast of the U.S. at three o'clock. We share spontaneously from the heart, from the soul, from the mind, from the spirit, from any place that's true for us, authentic for us. We share what it's like to live our everyday days as trauma survivors, claiming our birthright to live full, meaningful, joyful, fully alive lives. So we've talked about all kinds of things, Denise, like what are some of the topics we've we've talked about? My God, there's been some great things. Finding joy, that was one of yours recently. Right, right. Uh, you know, also the characteristics that we carry with us, uh, you know, that we acquired due to having to protect ourselves in a way that, you know, safe children do not. Right. That's very helpful. And that reminds me of a topic that you raised last time, which was an important one. And that was the topic of losing our innocence. And especially for those of us who were sexually abused, molested, um, incested. That's such a deep core violation. Can we reclaim our innocence? And we had a pretty powerful conversation about that. Essentially, Denise saying, I don't think so. But I have actually been, you know, tossing it around in my mind all, all week. Right. Like go, I go, do. Go. Yes. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking maybe that I was too fatalistic about that. You know, I always have believed that for my whole life now, uh, 65 years, once your innocence is gone, it's gone. But I'm now wondering if, you know, well, we grow other things, you know, our heal, our skin can grow, our brains can grow, our social circle can grow, things can grow. So, you know, maybe, maybe I have been able to, I don't know, it's, I'm, I try to figure out how I would define that for myself. Mm -hmm. And um, I often... Uh, thought of innocence being that adventurous part of myself that just goes, you know, like on a bike ride. That is how I felt safe and free and still a child, mm -hmm. even though, it, you know, I knew things I shouldn't know and I was exposed to things I shouldn't be exposed to. So I'm wondering if that, if I could like cultivate that, uh, at spirit of adventure, which I still do have, you know, like I approach things. Yes, you do. You without do. having a preconceived notion of how it's going to go or, you know, that's adventure. And maybe I can grow innocence again. Yeah, I'm really glad we're talking about this um, <clears throat> because there's a lot more to it. And in, in world religions, Innocence is a very big deal. Um, in fact, in everything, innocence is a big deal. And we struggle when we lose our innocence. And what does it mean to lose our innocence? And as I was listening to you, I thought, that's interesting. Is there a re religious definition here? Because our purity was taken from us, you know? Um, right. The, pur the purity of having been um, a virgin. You know, if I look for one then, for one part, yes, that for and one part. Um, for you know, believing that the world is a safe place and we should grow up here. You know, as a child, we just go play. And uh and that's adventure. I think what children are doing is exploring. They're they're being adventuresome when they go play. Right, right. They're discovering the world, right? Right. And uh, <laughs> they just start doing it. And it's so beautiful. And uh, you don't have to tell them anything. You can just right, watch them. They explore. know. Right. And they, they know. know. So tell me, now you have observed children 
especially like preschoolers for years. What is it? Can you describe what it is in a child? Like if you just let the child be and let the child play, like Maria Montessori said, let the child take the lead. What comes out of a child? What do you see in a child? Why is it okay for a child to just be on her own and explore? Uh, they're all so individualized. Uh, I'm, I, a certain child came to mind when you mentioned that. And he was a child that played away from other children. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to solve a problem. And he created the problem. <clears throat> so like he tried, he wanted to make a bridge from one place to another place. We studied the book, uh, Billy Goat's Gruff, and he wanted to make a bridge. And uh, wait a minute, did he really want to be the Billy Goat <laughs> under the bridge? <laughs> the troll. But he wanted to make the troll, the troll, that's right. <laughs> It's a troll. It's a anyway, troll so under the bridge. That's it. So what a you know what an archetypical primitive kind of thing, because crossing over from one place to another, the computer. Requires... He wanted to go from the computer monitor. We had an old PC with the monitor, you know, big thing. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and he wanted to bring it over to the table, which was a small group table, which was currently not occupied okay so he figured it out because he had to go up and over yes wow yeah. now that's fascinating when you think of i just came from a conference in tampa called one goal conference and i watched a presentation on play and the woman kept saying Okay, let's stop right in the middle of doing things. She would say, let's stop. Okay, so what are we learning about geometry? What are we learning about language? What are we learning about counting? What are we learning about um, storytelling? You know, like Colors, visual stimulation. I mean, geez. everything. Yeah. So why would we not let children do that? Why do you think parents are opposed to, until they learn about it, why are parents opposed to curricula that lets children play you know they don't i they just don't know the value of play and the value and, of play is what sweetie right and our the value of play is everything you can learn everything in play mm -hmm. but if you have like a specific concept that you're trying to present it's limiting and we have our culture our schools were really designed to create workers that are compliant and, you know, produce during these certain hours of the day. <laughs> yeah, in fact, it's fascinating because you know, we could say that our school systems are intent upon producing citizens who are obedient, loyal, don't rock the boat and uh, do what they're told to do. Because look at what has happened over the centuries in, uh, well, public schools. I was thinking just America, but I've been in other countries too. And what's, what's, what's rewarded is obedience, loyalty, being quiet, not disturbing, disturbing anyone and doing what you're told. The right. people who make a difference are the ones who say, well, I hear what I'm being told, but I don't, mm -mm. It's right. like the guy you're talking those, about. We don't need that many of those people anymore. <laughs> we need right. people that know how to collaborate, that know how to figure, try different options, uh, not be uh, devastated by a mistake, not try to please others, but try to engage their problem solving skills. What I hear you saying, Denise, is <clears throat> that sounds to me like what we want people to do, both children and adults, is to is to discover what they've got inside of themselves, to share. so that they can come up, with, you know, come up with something that's original and useful and helpful and fun and beautiful, and, and share it. Their their part. Yes. You know, my big thing is contribute. You know, I just want to contribute. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I have to believe that it, you know, that I have something valuable to contribute. 
Oh, you did, sweetie. And you you will be and you are. I mean, come on, you did 33, 35 years with Head Start. Many years. <laughs> many years with Head Start. And every child that came into your classroom found part of herself that she wouldn't have found. Every child that came in your classroom found safety that she might not have had at home. And every child in your classroom found things that she loved. Right. That she might not have known she loved. And every child that came in your classroom learned that she was precious in the context of other people who were precious. So she could seek what she wanted, but she couldn't hurt another person or herself right. in the process of seeking it. Now, those are life skills, girl. Right. Life skills. I mean, we're in America. I'm not going to talk politics, although it'd be very easy given the intensity going on. But, you know, we have some people who model harming others and putting others down. And we have some people who model, let's find what we can together here. Let's be a democracy. So it's it's a life skill. And I think it's what fascinates me when I'm at my saddest is that the life skill, skills I learned in school were about fitting in. They weren't about being creative. They weren't about contributing. They were about putting my head down and following directions and not bothering anybody. And particularly that was a gender role. Okay. Right. And inside me, like you, Denise, I said, there's something wrong with this, honey. There's something wrong with this. And that the true, true Holly Elisa is the one that says, I'm going to find my own way. Not right. that you're wrong in your way. I'm going to learn from you. I'm going to learn from you. And I'll tell you what I'm learning. And at the same time, I got to live a life that's authentic. And I did not learn in school to be authentic. I would you learn anything sweet? but anything but authentic. Right. Because I was a tomboy too. Yes, and, me too. You know, we were to have a lot of uh be a lady and all that stuff. I, and lady meant just 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 in case someone didn't get that. What did it mean when we were taught to be ladylike? Ladylike. Well, you had to keep your legs together was one of the rules. Uh, don't talk, really. Just be quiet and listen to either the men, usually the men. Uh, and I'd add to that, make the men feel good about themselves because it's very important that they feel good about themselves. Right. And my mother said all kinds of things to me, like, you know, don't, don't, you know, even if you know more than a man or even, she, actually, what she would never say to me that I knew more than a man, but she said, even if, uh, you're not interested. Just keep the man talking. Help him talk about himself because that's what they love to do. <laughs> you know, it's don't don't do. talk about yourself. Which, which we're not socialized so hard that way anymore. Hard. Some people still are. I mean, there are mm -hmm. what do they call them? Tra trad wives, traditional trad wife. <laughs> I and, haven't heard that before. Yes, it's a new thing that, well, it's not even that new. It's a tic tac talk thing. And oh, there's okay. groups of women that are, you know, trying to say they're traditional, but as it turns out, they're not really. But anyway. Well, if I'm reading, and again, I'm going to try to avoid politics. Why avoid politics? Because I want everybody to feel welcome here. Okay. And you can have whatever beliefs you have as long as. They don't mean you're going to hurt somebody else or yourself. That's the bottom line. It's like this nun, Madeline Birmingham, said to me, she, she died at age 94. She said to me, um, you know what? How, you can't make a wrong decision. And I said, what? that's so, so counterintuitive to me, Denise, because I thought I was raised like right, wrong, good, bad, black, white, you know, all of that stuff, male, female, hierarchy, lowerarchy. And uh, I said, why are you talking about Madeline? And, and she, I mean, I didn't say it out loud, but I just looked at her and she, I said, what's basically asking her what's going on? She said, Holly Elise, you can't make a wrong decision because you can learn from every decision. If you make a mistake and it's not good for you or somebody else, then you learn from it. I said, well, come on, Madeline, tell me more. There's got to be more. And she said, well, the only fatal mistake I can make, she didn't say fatal, she just said, the only mistake I can make, the only wrong decision I can make is to hurt myself or hurt somebody else. What do you think about that? 
Yeah, that's a good one. I When I was a teenager, I often recall myself saying, there are no bad people. They're, they can at least be a, an example of what not to do. It's like my friend, Dr. Deborah Renetta Sullivan, who said, my grandmother said, even a broken clock is right twice a day. I had never heard that before. I love that one. Well, girl, what we're talking about here is really important. And I want to just take a step back as we continue on innocence. <clears throat> Being survivors, I want to ask you if you're willing to, to just, um, I'll introduce it and ask you to tell people how to do it. We on this program know that trauma can be a scary thing. We talk about it in everyday ways, but there are times when we might be saying something like about five minutes ago, I said, Innocence is robbed when our sexual freedom, when we're when we're abused sexually, and I use the word incest, and I know just using, which is what I experienced, and I know <laughs> that just saying that word can trigger people right and left. So what we always want to do in every program is make sure this is a safe place for you to be where you don't, I mean, feel however you feel, but you know what to do with what you feel. There are times what Janice and I always say is, I got my water right here. I got my my water right in there. It's icy. Janice got hers. We need to. We take a drink of water. What are we doing? Well, our throats can get dry. That's one of the autonomic responses that we have as trauma survivors. So our throats get dry. That's what we do. My Sometimes, as Denise reminds me, my palms sweat. And when my palms sweat, that tells me, ooh, something's scaring me. And Denise, what are some other ways you know that you're getting triggered when you might not, not even be thinking about it? It might sneak up on you. A uh, jaw, my jaw gets tight. Right. Show me that thing. You do this thing if you're willing to with your mouth. Yeah, I get a little, it just gets tight. And like I can, my mom, my, I copied, I learned it from my mom. She does it too. And so I can always tell when I have I've crossed the boundaries of, her, her feeling safe. You know what? I used to be in a car with my father and I saw him do this thing with his finger, his thumb. He would do like this with his thumb all the time. He'd be holding on to the steering wheel and he'd be doing this with his thumb. And I thought, well, that must be really relaxing or he wouldn't do it. So I started trying it and it wasn't relaxing at all to me. And I thought, isn't that interesting? This is like one of those things that children learn on their own. I thought he was relaxing, but instead I think he was just being anxious. And that was just what he did to be anxious. Yes. <clears throat> and of course I picked up the anxiety. My Pippi did this on his steering wheel. Like he would always have his fingers wiggling on the top. And I'm sure it was anxiety too. Because when the kids were in the car, he didn't love it. <laughs> oh, I'm sure that's true. Pippi was. Right. Well, who was Pippi, sweetie? Oh, Pippi's my mom's father, my grandfather. Grandfather Pippi. Okay. So, yeah. That there's that. And when my my good friend Janie got co, got we, she and I were like we grew up on the same street, Orchard Drive, and we used to play together. Janie was more much more of a girly girl, and I was a tom girl, tom boy. But but when we were like four and five, we played with our beanbag frogs. We buried them in the sand, and we couldn't find them again. We got in trouble for that. We um, we got in a lot of trouble, which was good. So even though she was a girly girl, and I was like, I'm, I'm just gonna just jump across that stream. Um, we stayed friends. We're still friends. So it's been, well, if we're both 78, it's been about 75 years. And but when we got in trouble in first grade, they'd always, you know how they'd say, their t-shirts for little girls, they say, I'll talk to anybody I sit beside. Right. What they do is they'd separate Janie and me. They put, put us on the opposite sides of the classroom because we'd always be giggling and laughing, which I think was a good thing. But not, not to Mrs. McClure. So when Janie and I were not get, obedient, not quiet, not paying attention, not listening to teacher, not doing what I'm told, but having a good time on my own. Oh my God, what a horrible oh, thing. Rocking boat. <laughs> so here's what, what Janie and I would do. Wherever we got put, and we often got put in different places. We'd look at each other and just do 
And we'd giggle our butts off because we didn't, you know, we didn't, we weren't making any noise. And and we met again at our 25th high school reunion. So imagine that had to be at least like 50 years or something. And um, since we'd seen each other and although it wasn't that long because we, we actually, we stayed in touch ever after that reunion. However, the first thing we saw each other across a crowded room, I mean, we were all meeting in this big bar in Corning, New York, and we, and we looked at each other and went, <laughs> Fun. kids, don't forget the things that, that touch our hearts. Right. So, so can you tell folk about if, if something is scary that we're talking about, like, like the sexual abuse stuff, what can everybody do, at least in the United States, to get help if they need to talk with somebody? You can Google on your telephone, warm line, and it will give you a state-by-state phone number that you can call and talk to someone one-on-one. Yep, Denise is exactly right. Look up warm line. I, th- I think it would be helpful also to add the word trauma, warm line for trauma. <clears throat> and you'll find, just as she said, every state, now almost every state has a has a, a line. Right. You could a number you can call, and even some of them you can text now, which is fabulous. And because there are times when people are in a scary situation, they can't say anything out loud, but they could text. Oh my God, I'm going crazy here. Uh, What do I do? I see a person in the restaurant who's being very abusive verbally to his daughter. I know I don't have any right to say anything to him. What can I do? You know, that, that would help. Anyway, we want you guys to know that because. Being a trauma survivor means many things. It means, what does it mean to you, Denise? What's the what's one important thing about being a trauma survivor? Is we're trauma informed so we can help other people that are also, you know, who are experiencing trauma now or who are only on the beginning of their journey of healing their trauma, or you know, they don't they haven't acknowledged their trauma. We can be a beacon of light yeah i have an allergies today is that what's going on girl here you go (laughs) oh my god where was i oh last night i was in vermont and i asked i was in this room which was fine in a hotel and they had only like three kleenex in the kleenex box and my nose is running it's like one o'clock in the morning so i had to just get yourself a roll of toilet paper at least they had toilet paper but um yeah honey i just what? ran out of my tissues yesterday so i'll probably go after this and buy a box but anyway i'm glad you said that because there are times when i'm wiping my eyes and you know it's because i'm crying and there are other times i'm wiping my eyes because you know the allergies are running down i don't have them that badly but i i understand but i think another thing in addition to what denise said which is that we we've we've chosen to level with ourselves about being traumatized. And that took a really long time. And I'm from a family where people don't do that. They keep the secrets. They keep things silent. And as a result of that, I have been disowned by family members, not because they're mean or bad people, although that feels that way to me sometimes. It's like you said when you were a kid, Denise, there are no bad people, right? What there are... It's an example. (laughs) That's right. So what there are, people giving me plenty of examples of what it's like to be so um, caught up in the fear that, that I can't be around somebody that's scaring me. So, for example, <clears throat> here I am. I come in and I say, okay, um, you know, my father was violent. And that was really had an effect on me as a, as a woman. And I have done all kinds of things in my life, including when I went to law school with two of my feminist friends taking a self-defense course. Why? Because I was angry. I didn't want to, I didn't want to not be able to go out at night. This was at the time when people were talking about take back the night. So the three of us, we took a self-defense course and, and we learned how to flip men. We learned how to, um, you know, all these things, the, the thing that was hard for me was if somebody was pointing a gun at me, there is something I can do, but I thought, oh man, I got to be brave. I got to be quick. But what I'm trying to say here is that in my, fa- here's the point about the family. I have learned 
that in traumatized families where there is violence, sexual abuse, verbal abuse, and keep people keep it a secret, that, that those people hold on to a very thin thread of reality. And if they can all support each other in and not telling the truth. I was going to say in lying, but it doesn't feel like lying to them. It just feels like we got to do this to survive. <clears throat> if they can all support each other in saying, which they would about my father. Oh, what a wonderful man he was. What a wonderful man he was. And the next thing they would say is, look, he raised three wonderful daughters. Now, if we looked, and people used to say we're the perfect family, but if we look behind that screen, he beat the bejesus out of me. He sexually abused part of the innocence out of me. He shamed me so that I felt like I was, I just wanted to go out and eat worms. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. Just going to go out and eat worms. And when I got to the point in my life where I said, I don't deserve this. I didn't deserve this. And I was angry at him. I still can be angry at him, but I also get it. The trauma passes from generation to generation to generation. So what I got, even though my father would never talk about it, except maybe get a little bit close to it, he must have been traumatized too. And you know what? He was the son of immigrant parents. My grandmother never spoke English. Everybody I know that comes to this country that doesn't speak English gets brutalized in one way or another for that. And not only that, my grandmother, Adolorata, married a um, violent man who was also a misogynist, didn't like women at all. And so his saying, was proud of saying this, Denise, he would say, I never let my wife go to bed with an empty stomach. Now, first I thought, oh, good provider, food. No, no, no. That woman was pregnant. She was oh. pregnant all the time. My She got married. I think it was like 10 months later, my father was born. Soon after that, my aunt, what's her name? Philomena, called her Phyllis, was born. And soon after that, Aunt Asunta, Susan, boom, 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 boom. This woman had eight babies that survived, 14 that made it to birth, and the rest of them just, you know, and so I come from a long line of women who are seen as for only one function. <laughs> Incubators. Incubators. It's right. The trad wife. That was what you talk about, the trad wife on TikTok. Right. Anyway, I'm talking about this because what I've learned in the last couple of years working with some helpful trauma people is this. That my family, I don't need to judge them about this, but they hold tightly to a very weak string and they're all holding on to it. And they all, by holding on to it, they keep it protected. And the weak string is we're perfect. Nothing bad ever happened here. No one hurt anyone. That's just crazy, Holly. That's just cousin Holly. And, you know, I can get eliminated by saying, well, she doesn't respect the family or she's not one of us anymore, or worse, you know, she's a liar, she's not, you know, just, I don't even listen to what has been said about me, but I know when I don't get invited to family reunions. <laughs> right. Or even the saddest thing was two years ago when I was going to go visit at Conchetta Michiki Bruno. I wanted to, um, and, I, and I'm sorry I said her name. I'll just say that there was another relative that um, I wanted to go visit. One of the last remaining people from the immigrant generation. She was the daughter. Uh, she married my uncle, who was the son of immigrants. And I wanted to know, I've always just wanted to know what was the truth about the family. What did they eat for dinner? What did they, what kind of my like my grandmother Dolorato was supposed to be a great baker? What did she make? I, these are things that got cut off, shut off, cut, cut, slammed down. I don't know anything about that family. They kept everything a secret. My father at one point said, "Yeah, my." I used to say to him, "So, what did you have for for Christmas dinner?" He said, "Oh, I don't remember." 
Why? Because you know he remembered. Or or what did you you know what did you, what did your mother cook that she, that she made specially for you? Or what did your mother cook that you loved? The most I could get out of him was that she was a good baker. So I said, oh my God, did you, I love to make panettone? Panettone is this uh, Christmas bread that Italians make, and and I used to make it for Christmas and give it to all my relatives. And um, so did she make panettone? Or some people say panettone, and um, he didn't remember. One time after my mother died and he was, um, he, he lost his protection somewhat. Um, and he was, he lived alone for like over a decade after she died. Actually, it's more than that. She died July 4th, 1999. Could not make it into the new century of the new world. But he said to me one time, because I'll just sit there beside him. And so often we wouldn't talk, but I would ask questions and he either deny anything or I would get out the family scrapbook and show him pictures. And that sometimes ignited something. I said, I, Jim, I don't know who that called my father, Jim, out of disrespect, actually. <laughs> so I don't, I don't, um, I don't know who that person, who's that person. And then he would start recalling names and he could, you know, so that's how I learned some things. There was a picture of his father one time. And I said, you know, I, I didn't really get to know him. He didn't talk with kids very much. I remember when we arrived at his apartment, um, there was an inter internal room that the kids got told to go into and we were not supposed to talk. Can you imagine that gathering for Christmas and Easter, and you're not supposed to talk. But I remember it really well, because all of my, it was mostly boys in that family, and they had these dark Sicilian eyes, and that I remember my cousin Richard, like, be looking around, and we'd connect eyes, and, um, you know, we like a lot of communication taking place, but we weren't supposed to say a word, and the boys were good. They followed the law. And I thought, this is stupid, but, boy, you know, ain't nobody else can act up. <laughs> But anyway, I said, you know, I we, we weren't supposed to talk, um, so I really didn't get to know him well. And my father said something that was really revealing. It was like two or three words he said. I felt, well, I was like five or six words, I felt his hand on my rump too many times, too often. He was too strict, which was an understatement. That meant my father was abused as my father abused me. That was right. as close as he could get to it. So my father didn't come to the earth creating violence or beating or smacking women around. My father saw that. He saw it. And when I met my aunt, um, oh, dear, they all had these wonderful names. Her name was Marcia, but her real name was, um, it will come to me. It's a beautiful name. Anyway, um, she said as a little girl she would sneak around the back of the house and there was a, a stoop there that my grandfather and his friends would sit on and they all spoke italian she spoke italian she spoke italian and she said i heard them say such horrible things about women that i i never wanted to be around him and she was the one person that got out well, I guess another couple of other people got out too, but she got out when she was 16. She managed to graduate from high school early. That's She did it all on her own. Nobody knew what was going on. Then she got a uh, scholarship to go to the commerce school it was back in the day for like learning trades. So she learned secretarial skills at age 16 with handmade clothes sewed by her older sister, Philomena. Marsha got on the train from Buffalo, New York, and went to Washington, D.C., found the YWCA, walked in and asked for a place to stay, and found her a job with the federal government. I don't know if that was during World War II, it might have been, and stayed with the federal government, worked for all the presidents, um, extremely competent woman, and why was she, why did she get the motivation to do that? Because she did not want to be sexually abused by her father 
And I think he was saying that. She said she hated him for the things he said. Anyway, that's a long trope, Denise. Thank you for letting me do that. Talk about loss of innocence. That's what we're talking about today. And what we came, what we came to last week was Denise, Denise and I have both been thinking about it. We want to ask you, as a trauma survivor or knowing and loving someone as a trauma survivor, did you lose your innocence by being by being abused? And especially for, for like Denise and me, incest survivors. Did we lose our innocence? And last week, Denise said, I think I might have. I think I did. And I said, mm, I don't think I did. So Denise has been thinking about it. And Denise, what else have you been thinking about that tells you, hey, wait a minute, adventure, adventure, reclaiming my right to adventure. That's one way to reclaim my innocence. Right. What and else what, have you thought about? What yeah. goes with that is, because I'm out of the industrial revolution work ethic now you know i'm not okay. my hours okay. are not obliged to another company for you know whatever i don't have a job so it's uh it had so i'm going to try and use the time yes to stimulate that adventurous and you know, one way that I do that is I'm going to go look for butter monarch eggs. Like I can just spontaneously go, I'm going to go, because I have about five or eight places that I go hunt for monarch eggs. But it's been very disappointing this season because there's not a lot. Really? What's going on, do you think? Uh, I believe, well, the statistics are that last year and the year before that, there was a 2.4 increase in the number of monarchs that passed a certain point or what, you know, yeah. where they count, where they count them. And this year is uh, 0.9. So if last year I would have found it's down point down 2.9. So last mm -hmm. year, if I would have found three butterflies, I would have this year I would find one. But I'm not even that lucky this year. So how many have you found so far? I had six in June, which was quite unusual. I but remember that. And you named every one of them. I did. And I have the new ones named also. I, I'm i not sure how many are in there. I have a, <laughs> I had a couple different bushes that had uh, several eggs on them. Yeah. And I don't right now I just keep putting more leaves in there and I don't there's only one one that's a teenager and the rest are little and they hide. You know, that's they their hide? nature oh, because you know, birds and so, bugs, right? <laughs> so I don't even know really how many I have, but I will uh I have a very exciting opportunity on Thursday at a little farm school. And I'll be posting pictures about that on my page. Oh, and, good. Uh, yeah, I get to do a monarch. And then next Monday, I have another one. So good. I really want to find some more eggs. But I haven't been able to find it. So it's been a little disappointing. However, I get the urge and I feed it. I just go. I go right. and, find, and hunt monarchs, you know, and... uh so that's what I'm going to try to use that as my innocent uh, practice or whatever. Oh, I think that's a, I think you're coming up with a whole new, <laughs> whole new practice here for trauma survivors. And that's to reclaim our innocence. And right. you know, the question, you know, we've been dealing with the question, did we lose our incident in, in, in incidents? Did we lose our innocence? Was it stolen from us or did it just hide out like caterpillars because they're in danger, you know? Right. And I think what happened with me was my innocence went deep inside of me. But when I was in a safe place, my innocence still blooms, still blooms. I am at all excited because when I was in France, I started doing watercolors again. And I loved it so much. And I, I I remembered all these blockages I had, like, oh, anybody can do that, you know, the kind of self-criticism stuff. And then I said, wait a minute. Yeah, you know, I posted it online, like before, and I couldn't post it online. I posted it online, and I got all this feedback, and I thought, oh, people are just being nice. I said, wait, stop. 
you know you've said that to yourself for years, Holly Elisa. You know, anytime a compliment comes my way as a trauma survivor, I say, Oh, it's nothing. I just got that dress from TJ Maxx. Right. You know, if they really knew me. If they really knew me, they would know I'm a great imposter. Right. right. So those are the things we do to ourselves. So I said, you know what? You're doing that to yourself. I mean, even my sister, who's very limited on her praise, said to me, you've got talent. She didn't have to say that. Right. Um, and then there are other people who said, I thought you were posting art from art galleries. <laughs> I didn't think that you were posting your own work. So it's not so much the feedback. It's just the opening. Right. The opening of innocence that, and here's what I'm going to get it all at Twitter about. And here's innocence when I get Twittery on the inside. <laughs> You and I talk about this when we're attracted to somebody. There's that sort of patience, like that frisson of um, excitement, like there's promise here, there's hope here. And so I feel that way about watercolors. This is my first day back. And I'm wanting, now my next thing is to figure out how can I get some kind of a place to take with me so I can paint watercolors? Because with watercolors, you can't have an easel where things go like that or the watercolor be dripping. Right. And I have flat. So I'm going to go seek out or maybe have somebody build me if I have to. A um, print is something I can hold up and take with me. So I pull my car over and I go out in the field and I do water. But anyway, what I'm trying to say here is I feel, Denise, that what you that, that what is innocence? It's being open to adventure. And what is being open to adventure? That's one definition. What's another way of looking at innocence? It's being open to the possibility that within me in fact i believe the probability that within me is this place of innocence and delight that i can reclaim and when i see the watercolors what i the way i do watercolors is i just put water on the paper and then i choose some colors and i drop them on each other and they start spreading and as they start spreading i start seeing what the watercolors are showing to me it's very different than when I was sitting on the top of this riverboat and there were like maybe 15 other people taking this watercolor and workshop. Um, no, we weren't being taught. We were just being given the tools. And I noticed everybody had a concept. I'm going to draw this scene out, outside on the river. I'm going to draw my cat. I'm going to do this. People had something that they thought I didn't. And I think that adventure of not knowing what's going to emerge on the on the on the paging and then seeing often seeing a part of my life emerge. So right. for example, that morning I had I had taken photographs of something that was like a French howling off. I had never seen anything like it, but it stood tall and proud by this old shed shed and it was colorful. And I got up close and I took pictures. And I realized that went right into my soul. It was something beautiful is with me it goes right into my soul it communicates directly with my soul i didn't have people that i could communicate with like that because they were not safe but when i was out in nature i could communicate with trees and now thank god people are saying trees can count trees can communicate you know i felt trees, bad. trees have community they have a community honey and that's why the first day of the shutdown when the these forests next door, my property of butts of forest, I heard weeping, not literal weeping, but I just heard sorrow. And I went out and I saw that these old trees were being cut down to put up an apartment building. I had that experience also when I lived in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, the people that I lived with uh, built a house so they were the first house in that cul-de-sac. And then they cut down the trees next door to put another house. And I really felt those trees were sad. Um, I mean, it's their property. It's land is your right. land. It's man land is my land. You know, it's the trees. Land. <laughs> right. Which is right. why we have so much respect for indigenous people who get it, you know. And then what do we do? We introduce all kinds of drugs and alcohol and stuff like that to take them away. Uh -huh. Anyway, sweetie, we've got about 12, 15 minutes left. And, and I'm thinking, 
let's let's focus on innocence. Um, what else have you been realizing about innocence? Because you said you were you were flip flopping all over the place last week thinking about right, it. Right, thinking about it. Well, um, also I wondered if I was feeding my innocence, which I now think I was, by observing children in their innocence. You were. That's a great thing. Say more about that, sweetie. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what what I have said for a long time is I gave myself a happy childhood in my classroom around the sandbox, basically. And uh, how did you do that for people that haven't taught? You know what? Children are always there. We can interact with children or just observe children. So right. how, describe how you gave yourself a happy childhood. Uh, I got purple sand. <laughs> and uh, filled the sandbox. It was an indoor sandbox. And I would just go up to it and get on my knees. I was always putting different things in there, too, to, you know, stimulate different interests. And uh, I would just go up there and start playing by myself. And then the kids would engage me, of course. And it was fun. Can you give me an example of how one child engaged you? Because I know every child engaged you in her own way. Right. Um, like, for example, if I had seashells or rocks in there, they would find one and then they would engage me in by let's make a let's make a treasure chest. Let let's find a place to put all the treasures or some, you know, something that they want me to do with them. And look how powerful that is. They believe in a world that has treasure. Right, right. And they believe that they have the power to make a treasure chest. I mean, when I was a little kid, this is one of the, th- you know, I kept reading about three wishes. And my, of course, my first wish was to get out of this crazy place, <laughs> have a happy family. But I but I realized that whenever somebody asked, asked for something, in the three wishes, it was a little kid, you know, I thought they're not getting it or they get just this fat, the stuff they want and then they outgrow it or something. So I said, oh, I got this down. Little kid, I'm saying, I want endless wishes. So it's like kids believe, I believe myself too. I believe, yeah, okay, I got it. It's just, when that person comes along and offers me a wish, I'm gonna say, thank you very much. I would like to have endless wishes. Okay. Not okay. Well, what do you mean? Not okay. You said (laughs) any wish. We thought about that uh, because of Disney movies, I think, you know, or whatever, Mm -hmm. even stories that were, we were exposed to. Yeah. And I didn't get three wishes. Yeah. Oh, Oh, those things. Yeah. Right. I heard about the three wishes and you were granted three wishes and then it was over and people Regretted their wishes. But what I'm talking about here is the innocence. Like a child would come up to you in the purple sand, which is great, you did purple sand, and they'd find a stone and they'd say, Let's make a, a treasure chest where we can. And as this stone became a treasure, why? Because it was hidden. And right. she found, yep. found it too. Get up. It, and it was magical, you know. That's another thing about innocence. It's kind of magical and it allows imagination. So, girl, you you nailed it. You said innocence is adventuresome. There's a sense of discovery. There's magic about it. We find things that absolutely delight us. I think there's originality in innocence because I have to be authentic. If I'm just learning what somebody else learned, it doesn't touch me. (laughs) But if I'm learning something that touches me, there's innocence. What else is part of innocence? You know. I don't know. Uh, relax. It's a relaxed uh, state of body. It's a relaxed state of body. And actually our brains uh, stop the judgmental stuff and go into the trust stuff. And as which what I want to say about that is instead of saying, oh, that won't work or that's not going to happen. Or it's like walking into a group of teachers and saying, well, we tried that before. It doesn't work. When a child is innocent or adults innocent, the person is saying, this is going to happen. I believe it's going to happen. I don't know how. That's another part. It's like trust. And the key about trauma survivors is we were taught 
shut up. Don't you dare trust any of these people because they're going to hurt you and they're supposed to take care of you. So right. never, the, don't believe the people that, that were uh, mm -hmm. molesting us. We couldn't mm -hmm. trust them. We weren't allowed to. We were threatened to not trust anybody outside of that because you can't tell. Yeah, They're trust is, trust was a huge loss in abuse. Did you learn, what did you learn about trusting yourself as a survivor? I don't know. I've, I've been pretty self-reliant and uh, uh, sometimes I'll say fiercely independent, which actually could turn out to be not that helpful. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on that concept also, you know, that's, it's good to be fiercely independent and to take mm -hmm. care of yourself and to, uh, you know, have self-regulation skills and all that. However, it also could be a barrier to others. So oh, that's a really sound point again, because I, when I, if I were to answer my own question about what did I learn about trusting myself? <clears throat> um, well, I learned I couldn't trust anybody, so I had to do it myself. But I also that that led to many other things like perfection. I wasn't going to do anything unless I could do it perfectly because then I'd be criticized. I remember my mother, she was abused, too. She was an incest survivor. I'm convinced she would see me as the youngest in the family trying to do something. And if I couldn't do it fast enough and well enough, she just grab it out of my hands and say, want something done right, do it yourself. I think the issue of trust that's the hardest for me is, yeah, it's really hard not to trust authority figures. Mm -hmm. And I don't, they got to prove themselves to me. I mean, I have all kinds of stories about that, but, but I need people. I, I, I can't live alone. I mean, I'm living alone, but I, I'm happier living in community. I want to live in community, and that takes skills. I want to go back, though, to this thing about, it's like your desire to contribute. I want to be a useful, helpful part of a community. I want to bring joy. I want to bring connection. I want to bring help people find the meaning. That's That's my strength. That's my gift. I think the hardest thing, though, about trust was that I was brainwashed not to trust myself. I wrote in my book, um, Happiness is Running Through the Streets to Find You. If I could pull it up, it would say, well, I guess I don't know if you guys can pull see that. Back. Pull it back towards you. Back, 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 back. Well, there it is. There it was. There it it's is. Flash. There it is. <laughs> so what I wrote in here is, oh, my God. Um, I wrote... When my fa I was telling my father something and he didn't approve of what I had seen. This was when I was like 17 years old and I'd gone away to college and I had seen my uh, some of this it was a women's college and so, so women were helping women grow up. It was really nice. So the seniors took the first year women and took us to Greenwich Village in New York City so we could experience being in a city and feeling safe. And... At the time, I think maybe 17, I don't know, it was, you could, you could drink in New York State more than, well, you couldn't drink in New Jersey. So they took us to have our first drinks, which was right. a really smart thing. I mean, it was like sisters helping. I loved it. Anyway, I was so fascinated by being in Greenwich Village in the early 1960s, which was funky time, funky town. And I saw these people coming by and they had luxurious honeyed curls and they had feather boas on and they were strutting and they were um they were uh, call from and one night tip. they would call again how about that that was spam anyway they were they, they were elegant they had feather boas they had earrings they earrings they had they were just charming and they walked by and they were uh, talking with each other and just, and I loved them. I loved them. And the people I was with loved them too. I mean, it was like, this was like real theater in, in Greenwich Village. They were doing, I, I just thought they were fab. I didn't label them. 
I just love him. So when I got back in December to my family's house in upstate New York, very rigid, very beautiful, but very conservative upstate New York, I was I was telling my father about my courses, what I was learning in in the calculus class, which I hated, and stuff that he would have liked, you know, the STEM stuff. And then I said, oh, but because for me, learning was across the board. It wasn't just in the classroom. So I said, oh, yeah. And I went to New York City and my God, it was fascinating. Never been to Greenwich Village. And I, then I started describing these people coming by. And my father knew what I had seen. People in drag, you know. Right. And so he stood up over me and he was about six feet tall. He stood up over me. I weighed 100 pounds. Used his force as a threat and said, I'm not going to look in the eyes like he did. You didn't see that, daughter. So I'm convinced that the times, many times when he was abusive to me, he would say, and if you tell anybody, you're done. So I learned Denise not to trust myself. And one of the hardest things has been to trust myself and to believe myself. And I think one of the mental challenges that comes to trauma survivors is we don't believe ourselves. You tell me that's the way, that's the answer. Oh, okay. That's the answer. When I was in my worst shape in high school, because my father was abusing me, my mother was having a nervous breakdown. I would just go to class and I'm telling the truth here. I would cheat. I would cheat because I didn't think anything mattered anymore. There was no integrity. I would cheat just to get through the class and I'd feel horrible about myself. But it's what happens to a trauma survivor when nothing is worth anything anymore. I'm not worth it. I don't even trust myself. So a big part of my journey toward innocence and toward reclaiming myself is trust, trusting myself. And yet, here's what I also discovered. I always did trust deep down in my soul. I did trust myself. I know what the answer is. I know what the truth is. I take a sounding and I go deep. And that's how I'm living my life now. Do I make mistakes? Oh, yeah. There's sometimes I'm too frank with people that aren't ready to be frank. But is the frank thing, is the thing I'm being frank about the truth? Yeah. Yeah, it is. And that's what matters to me. So, sweetie, we're coming to the end. Innocence, anything else you want to say? Because I love that you've been reflecting on this. I will continue to reflect on it and, uh, you know, jibble and javel and juggle it around in my world. <laughs> and, uh, you know, try to grow it, try to find it in there, maybe. What? Why would you want innocence? Why would that matter to you? Uh, because it's fun. It's also timeless. Does that make sense? Yeah. When a child is engaged in play, the, the clock stops ticking. Yes, it's just today, that's all. It's just today. When people fall in love, the clock stops ticking. Right. It's just now. And that is an innocence I that I've reclaimed. Because when, and here's the deal, whenever I got to go outside, I found that again. Right. Religious people would say, well, that was God, and that's fine. Uh, I just found such beauty. And I can go out there today. I'm looking out at the what's left of the forest, and there's plenty of it. Thank God. Um, I could go out there the day, and it, it takes 10 minutes before the rhythms of nature get, get. I'm back in innocence. I'm back in innocence. It's an adventure to go out there. Yep. On, on the path to innocence. So what questions would you like to ask or what is there any question you'd like to ask, ask our listeners to help them as trauma survivors or friends of trauma survivors look at their own understanding of innocence? What would you ask them? Uh, do, do you have innocence? Do you rely on your innocence? Uh, what What's it... What's it the same as? What's it the same as? And what would you say to a child if you were exploring innocence with a child? I mean, just, the kids get it. Kids they're get just it. in it, right? I I don't know. 
I might ask them, you know, what are you playing? Why are you playing? How did you know how to play that? Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Tell me well, that's fascinating. Where did you learn how to play that? Or, you know. Yeah. Tell me about this. You want to build a bridge, a bridge from where? Okay. Right. A bridge to where? Okay. And why a bridge? Why not just um, walk it? Just to like, helping them understand that when they're in that state of creativity, there's another part of innocence, creativity. Right. The, 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 the world goes on forever. We don't have to put happiness away. The discovery goes on forever. That's actually my trauma survivors hope for my, people call it transition. When I die, I hope to have enough fascination and curiosity to say, all right, I, I feel like hell right now, but I want to. What's next? What's going? What's next? Right. Like, what's next? What's next? You know, and if it's if it where is are we going? Simple, where am I going? Where are we going? If it's as simple as ashes to ashes, dust to dust, then that's an experience too. You know, that's right. what I observed. Anyway, our friends, our friends, we, we've been with you for an hour, and this is how it is. We do trauma survivors walking each other home, and each time Denise and I talk, speaking for myself, I discover something. I discover something, and and thanks to Denise, and we're uh, pursuing healing. That's you know through this hour, we're pursuing healing. We're learning from each other different things that we couldn't have thought of of our own. That's being part of community, and that's why Denise is saying, as I think why Denise is saying, but you tell me why. Yeah, it's great to be really self sufficient, but it's. It's beautiful to be able to discover the world with other people. And that leads to giving back. You help me. I hope I can help you. It's not a quid pro quo. You help me, therefore I must help you. It's like, oh man, Jason, I never thought of putting that rock there. Look what you did. <laughs> no, we could do that. I'll build a bridge. So wait, you can start from both sides, not just one. Oh, that makes sense. Oh my goodness. I want to close with one thing, Denise. I, I was with a group of adults one time and we were learning skills and it was more about like learning about ourselves. And we canoed out to an island in South Carolina. And our task when we got to the island was to take whatever we could find and get ourselves back to the other shore. The canoe had gone back. So it was like one of those survivor things. So I looked at this and I said, we're not going to do that. I don't, I don't think so, but let's give it a try. So there were people that stepped up that thought they were engineers and they could build a raft. And so um, they were doing all this stuff and they got everybody organized. And I, I, I said, what can I do here? So I built flags to cheer us on <laughs> as we're crossing the water. That's my contribution. And other people doing oars and stuff like that. Well, I knew this thing was not going to work because, you know, we all sort of know what flows and what doesn't flow, right? right? And yet I went with it because I thought the people that know about building floats, maybe they do. I'm willing to say they got strengths I don't have. The people that know about this other stuff, good for them. And my contribution well, here it was actually, they were in charge and they weren't open to stuff, other stuff, other ideas. So I just said, I'm just going to make my own contribution and waving those flags. <laughs> that was my contribution. And there it is, holding on to innocence and believing, here's another part of innocence, believing that I have something of worth to offer. Yep. You made the sand purple. I made the flags of victory. We're going to do this. Yeah, I'll tell you later what happened with this raft. <laughs> okay. For now, because Denise was getting ready to wave. Fairly well, and thank you for being with us. And we hope to see you next week. And you know what? Tell other people about this. Last week, we had a delightful experience with another person being on. We've had that in the past. It's been great. So come join us. Yep. And we'll be publicizing every Monday 
um, the link. So all I have to do is click on the link, even if you haven't saved it. So my friends, are you an innocent? Are we all innocents? There are songs to? that do we have innocence? Do we still have it, even though it might have gotten beaten out of us? Was it still beaten down into hiding like those baby caterpillars that Denise works with? Are they just hiding to, to live until they can live and become very hungry caterpillars? Yes. And if they get through that, Denise, what happens next? A beautiful butterfly flies <laughs> away. Right. And that's my hope for trauma survivors, that we are in the chrysalis or maybe we're just eating our way <laughs> whatever we're doing it's like being a trauma survivor because the threat is always there right and the promise the promise is always there so denise i hope you find a number of new troves for monarch butterfly eggs thank you hope you do Appreciate and it. i'll see you next week and we'll see where we've gone with yeah. our innocence Fare thee well, everybody, and...